do in organic chemistry. It is just an amazing science. Organic chemistry evolved into biochemistry. Um, if you ever take biochemistry, it depends a lot on who you take it from. If you take it from a biologist, it'll probably be boring. But if you take it from an organic chemist that can appreciate the chemistry behind it, uh, biochemistry is also a phenomenal subject to look at. Let's start off just with a very basic concept. This is the concept of valence. We all know that molecular compounds form covalent bonds. Valence simply is a number to describe how many bonds it forms. For something like oxygen, we form two bonds. We have two pairs of electrons left over, still an octet around the oxygen. For nitrogen, we form three covalent bonds, one unshared pair. For boron, also has a valence of three, but no electrons, so it only has six electrons around it, making it very hungry for electrons, called a Lewis acid. But carbon, carbon will form four bonds. That's kind of a rule, and that's going to last all the way through this lecture and through all of organic chemistry. Carbon will form a total of four bonds. Now let's think about that in terms of carbon and its place on the periodic table. Carbon is over here in group six. So the 1s is filled. Dealing with the second period, we have two electrons in the 2s, two electrons left over. They look right over here. So we're going to put those in two p orbitals. Now, this gives us an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, and 2p2. Now, we remember that in order to form a bond in a molecular compound, what you have to do is have an unshared electron here because you're going to share that with somebody to make a bond, right? So if we look at this, we would say, well, carbon is kind of set up to make two bonds. That would be a valence of two. But the fact is that carbon has a valence of four. So in order to do that, we're going to have to split up these electrons. This is what we're starting with, 2s2, 2p, 1 and 1. In order to form four bonds, we have to take one of these from the S and move it up here to a P. What we've done is the process of hybridization. In hybridization, we take one S and two P's and we form an S and three P's out of it. We now have a valence of four, and this is going to be called an SP3 hybrid. Now the reason this happens is that carbon compounds can now adopt a very stable geometry. The geometry is tetrahedral. All of these bond angles are 109.5 degrees. They're all the same. All the bond lengths are the same. The tetrahedron, as we've talked about earlier, is a uh, uh, geometric structure that isn't talked about in kindergarten, so nobody knows it. But it's really very important in life as we know it that the carbon here is suspended in between these four hydrogens. All these distances are equal. All the angles are equal. This is tetrahedral geometry. So again, in order to do this, we had to hybridize 
1s and 3p orbitals to make this as a structure. We will refer to these as sp3 carbons. An sp3 carbon will have single bonds to four things, and it will have 109 degree bond angles between all of them. Any questions? All right. The neat thing about carbon is just like Tinker Toys or Legos or whatever, you can hook them together. Here we have three sp3 carbons all hooked together. Each of these carbons is bonded to four different things using only single bonds. This is the simplest functional group in organic chemistry. Now, a functional group in organic chemistry simply describes a group of compounds, typically a huge group of compounds, but they all have the same basic reactivity. This functional group is called an alkane. As far as the exam goes, make sure you know the word alkane. In an alkane, <clears throat> we will only have sp3 hybridized carbons, and they will all be hooked together. Everybody will have four bonds. Now, we know that each of these bonds, each of these carbons, is tetrahedral. As I've drawn it out this way, it's totally boring. The way it really looks, with each of these carbons being tetrahedral, is something like this. Here's our tetrahedral carbon, three hydrogens, and a bond to another carbon. Here we have bonds to two carbons, two hydrogens, and again a CH3 on the end. All of these are tetrahedral carbons, and this is an example of an alkane. Now again, just like we were dealing with tinker toys, we can take one of these carbons and we can attach anything in the world to it. An example here, if we stick a CH3 on one of these carbons, if we have four in a row, and we've stuck a CH3 up here. It would look something like this. This is a branched chain alkane. Why is it still an alkane? It's an alkane because all of the carbons are sp3 hybridized. They're all bonded to four things by single bonds. And each of these geometries is identical. They're all tetrahedral. Any questions? Now, as these things have been flying by, I hope you've been counting carbons and hydrogens. But if you haven't, let's look at a couple examples here. This is the three carbon unit that we looked at. Here's the, the four carbon chain with a CH3 sticking off. If you add up the numbers of carbons and hydrogens in an alkane, it will always come out to this formula, CnH2n plus 2. So here, our n is 3, 3 carbons. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 more is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Over here, we have an alkane again, only sp3 carbons. Everything has four bonds. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons. <clears throat> so n is five. 
2 times 5 is 10, plus 2 is 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. When you have a compound with a general formula, CnH2n plus 2, that is an alkane. It's the simplest functional group in all of organic chemistry, perhaps the most boring, because it doesn't do a whole lot of chemistry, but it is the simplest. Any questions? Now let's say we have an alkane and we want to call it something. You could, if you were a chemist and you discovered it back in the old days, you could call it George if you want. You can get away with that in the old days. Now you can't quite get away with that, but in the old days you could. Now we have a very systematic way of naming compounds. And this is going to be based on the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. So you're going to look at your molecule, and you're going to say, what's the longest chain of carbons I can make out of this thing? Once you find that, then you look at your table, or of course you memorized it by now, and look at the number of carbons in this chain. It's going to be a meth, eth, prop, but, pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec, and whatever. Those prefixes will tell everyone the number of carbons in this longest continuous chain. We're going to add A and E and all of these to indicate that we're dealing with an alkane. Now, once again, an alkane. What do we know about the alkane? Remember this. This is important for this exam. But the alkane, we're going to have CnH2n plus 2, and everything in there is going to have four bonds Everything in there is SPQ. That's an alkane. If we have side chains, remember we had a CH3 sticking off the side? Well, we can't just call that a CH3. That's not official enough. It has one carbon, so it's a derivative of what would be methane? Meth means one. And we're going to call this side chain that sticks out methyl, YL, to indicate that it's attached to somebody else's chain. We're also going to use this name as we do other organic compounds. If we have an OH attached, this would be methyl alcohol, the OH group represents the functional group alcohol. And again, the deep thing about functional groups, even though there are thousands and thousands and thousands of molecules that have the OH group, they're all going to share the same reactivity. That's what makes organic chemistry manageable. So this is methyl alcohol. If we happen to have an amino group on the end, this would be methyl amine. Once again, the point here is that the side chain is simply based on the number of carbons, and it's the same numbering system except with YL added to it. The alkane, CH4, methane would be its name. If our side chain was CH3, it would be methyl. Two carbons, that would be ethane. 
our two carbon side chain is ethyl. Three propane, propyl, butane, butyl, pentane, pentyl, and so on and so on. Now this can get really complicated, but the, the root of it is fairly simple. If you have a side chain on somebody else's parent, you just look at the number of carbons, put a YL on it, and that describes it. Now, when you look at a carbon compound, um, the structural thing that you see can just be totally impressive. Um, this is a simple alkane. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons in our longest chain. So it's a pentane, isn't it? Pent for five. Here we have a single carbon side chain. That's a methyl. So this is a methyl pentane. If we were to give this a real name, and we'll see this in a minute, we would want to start here, so that would be one. So this would be a two methyl pentane. Here we've taken six carbons and put them in a ring. Now these are all sp3 carbons, but because they're in a ring, they're a separate functional group called a cycloalkane. But again, all of these are simple tetrahedral carbons. Here we have a um, polycyclic compound, actually. We have one ring here, another ring coming up, Another ring coming down. Um, I'm not going to name this, but it's a very complex organic molecule. And once again, it, you just can stick these things together any way you want and make virtually any kind of compound that you want if your synthetic skills are good enough. We can also do organic compounds with other atoms included. Oxygen is red, nitrogen is blue. This is glucose. Glucose starts off with a ring here. It's a six-membered ring with one oxygen in the ring. As we go around, we have OHs all around here. Those are alcohol functional groups. This is glucose. This is morphine. Morphine, we have carbon-carbon single bonds, and double bonds. We also have a nitrogen in a ring down here. Once again, the structures you can make with organic compounds are just incredible. One of the real challenges in organic chemistry is being able to take your molecule and draw it in such a way that other people can see what you're doing. You clearly can't do this. These are models generated by a computer. Doing this by hand would be very, very difficult. In terms of computer animation of these things, there are three basic modes that we use. This, quite obviously, is what's called the ball and stick. We use little balls to represent the atoms, and we lose sticks to represent the bonds. If you do away with all the balls and just keep sticks only, you get what's called a driving model. Looks something like this. But again, you can see this is a carbon with three hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, and three. The thing that shows it best is the space filling model. Now all these are on the same scale. So this is what this really looks like. 
what the space filling model does is it goes out and does the van der Waals radius. So that's the approximating where the electrons are in each of these atoms, puts them together, and makes our model this way. Space filling model is really nice. Um, it's quite often difficult to interpret in terms of the bonding. For that, ball and stick are driving our best, but in terms of getting a feel for what it really looks like, this is probably the best way to look at it. When we talk about organic compounds, there are a number of ways we can show them. The simplest way is just the molecular formula. Number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygen, nitrogens, whatever. Just like this. But that tells us nothing about how it's bonded together. A condensed structure. In a condensed structure, we're taking the actual chain of carbon atoms and we're abbreviating. This tells us we have a carbon with three hydrogens, like this one, bonded to a carbon with two hydrogens, carbon with two hydrogens, and finally one with three. So it's a nice, simple way to abbreviate the thing. It does tell you what things are strung together, uh, but if you get a more complicated molecule, this can be really, really tough to write and interpret. This is what's known as a Kekulé model. Now, Kekulé is a famed chemist in organic chemistry, um, the guy that kind of figured out what benzene was, the concept of resonance and stuff like that. Um, he drew his structures showing all the atoms and all the bonds and stuff like that. Um, this tells you exactly how they're connected, um, tells you exactly what's there, but it's a real bother to draw. You get so tired of doing little dashes and H's and C's and stuff like that. Therefore, organic chemists devise what's called a line drawing. Now, a line drawing is really a shorthand for the Kekulé structure. Now this is important because when I do something on an exam or a quiz, it's probably going to be in some sort of a line drawing or a modified line drawing. Or I might give you one of these and ask you to make one of these. Whenever you see just a simple vertex, two lines coming together, nothing else attached, that tells you it's a CH2. When you look at a line drawing, you assume that every point here is a carbon. And it's going to have the appropriate number of hydrogens. So this carbon, at the end, must have three hydrogens. as a valence of four. One, two, three. That's that. This is a truncated line. Anytime just a line goes out and stops in space, that's a CH3. This is a CH2. So is this, and another CH3. Converting between Kekulé and line drawings is really important in organic chemistry. Now, once again, we're not doing organic chemistry. I would love to take you guys all through organic. I really would. But we're not going to do that, in spite of myself. But um, I might ask you very simple questions on conversions from one to the other. Any questions? Let's look at just a simple conversion. 
Now we've said that every truncated line, a line that just ends up in nowhere, this guy, this carbon must have three hydrogens. It's a CH3. The vertex must have two, and this CH3 must have three. Now remembering that is difficult enough, but organic chemists trying to be helpful have devised lots of different ways to modify the basic line structure to make it easy for you. That is, instead of just having these things as truncated lines, we can put CH3s on the end. We look at that and say, okay, I can do that. CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. Some people, however, look at this and say, well, wait, that looks stupid. This looks like the hydrogens are bonded back to this carbon, not the carbon. So let's turn it around and make it H3C. So you have this, CH2, CH2, CH3. This is probably a more accurate representation. But any time you look at structures in organic chemistry, you're going to see an absolute hodgepodge of representations. Absolute mess. And it's your job as a student to understand it all, of course. You will see line structures, you will see these guys, you'll see these with a bit of ambiguity, and you'll probably see a whole lot more. Let's look at one other way to complicate this. What if we took our modified line drawing here and we wanted to talk about what we'll call the stereochemistry? Stereochemistry is very important in organic. Stereochemistry refers to the absolute orientation in space of all of these a particular carbons, hydrogens, or whatever. One way that we could do that is to take our simple line drawing and tip it. Now we're going to tip it so that we're going to look down one end here. This is going to be our front, that's going to be our back, and we're going to call this a sawhorse projection. Now, if you imagine rotating the back one here so it had legs, that's where a sawhorse comes from, of course. The front carbon here has two hydrogens and a CH3. The back carbon, two hydrogens and a CH3. A classic, simple sawhorse projection. This is really useful if you want to understand the orientation of the various atoms along our carbon-carbon bond. And to make things just a little bit more complicated, you can take this and do it all the way and actually look straight down this bond. So this will be our front carbon, that will be the back. We're looking straight down this way. And this is what's called a Newman projection. This is our front carbon, CH3, two hydrogens. The back carbon we make big, so we know it's big, it's back, B for back. Two hydrogens and a CH3. Once again, you can be given all sorts of bizarre representations. And one of the great challenges of organic is being able to interpret these in terms of what the molecule really is. I have a little movie that I made to show the transition here. So let's look at that. <clears throat> This is a simple writing. 
CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. I'm going to take this first, convert it to a sawhorse. When I do that, this comes forward, this goes back. There we go. Now if we look straight down, shoot, <laughs> let's go back. Now we're going to look straight down this bond this way. There's our back carbon. There's our front. This is a Newman projection. So all we're doing is twisting this thing and turning it, etc. I'm telling you all this because if you ever go in an organic book and look at structures, there's no telling how they're going to look. Let's do some simple problems. Now this is something that some of these are simple enough that you can find on your exam that's coming up. Here we have a carbon compound in a condensed format. Convert that into a line drawing. Now remember when we do a line drawing, you want to do a zigzag pattern. Why the zigzag? Because that approximates the 109 degrees of the tetrahedral geometry. So the first thing you have to do is figure out how many zigs and zags you need here. How many carbons are in the longest chain? One, two, three, four, five. These guys are written in parentheses, which means that they're attached to carbon number two. So to make our zigzag, we simply need five zigs and zags. And it could look something like this. One, two, three, four, five. Doesn't matter if it's up, down, sideways. You'll note that my angles are exactly 109.5, because I'm very good at this. Now, we look here at carbon number two. We have two methyl groups, right? What's a methyl group in a line drawing? It's just a truncated line coming off, isn't it? So here on carbon 2, we have two methyl groups, and they simply look like that. Two CH3s attached to carbon 2. Our next compound here, we have a ring. Each of these are tetrahedral. All of these angles are exactly 109.5. This is cyclohexane, a marvelous compound. If I was gonna draw this as a line drawing, I would simply look at my carbons. At the very least, I would say, okay, I have six carbons, I need to draw a perfect hexagon. Has to be perfect. However, if you don't the geometry here, this kind of goes down, up, down, up, down, up. Probably the best way to draw a cyclohexane would be something like that. Now we're not going to talk about this, but this is what's called the chair conformation. Use your imagination. This is like a little chase lounge or something. You're, you're sitting here, here's your head, here's your feet, etc. The chair conformation. We'll see that later in life, you did this, you would see there's also a boat conformation, etc. Whatever. 
but this is a, if you drew a perfect hexagon, I would also be thrilled. Art really matters in organic chemistry. When I say perfect hexagon, of course, we mean perfect. Now here we've thrown in a ringer. We have a Newman. In order to untangle the Newman, we have to figure out where the heck all these things are bonded and to whom, what the longest chain is. So step one, I'm going to say my longest chain is going to be one, two, three, that's the front, four is the back, five, six. So I want a six carbon zigzag. On carbon one, two, three, I have a methyl group. Carbon four, I have another methyl group. Six carbon zigzag, carbon number three, we have a methyl, four, we have a methyl, and that's the structure. Now I realize that I've done this before and you haven't, so let's just take a moment and untangle this step by step. <clears throat> Here's what we had. Here's the correct answer. What's the simplest way? Well, remember, we got here by taking a sawhorse and twisting it a little more, looking down the bond, right? Well, let's make it back into our sawhorse. If we do that, we're going to turn so this is in front, this guy is in back, and we can draw this. The front carbon has a two carbon chain, a hydrogen and a methyl. Back carbon, that's the big guy here, two carbon chain, hydrogen, methyl. Now you can easily see our longest chain is one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon three, we have a CH3. Carbon four, we have another one. Now, you're probably not going to have to do this on the exam, but it's a fun thing to think about. Any questions? Well, when we were drawing the structure just a little bit ago, I had a question, and I love questions, that's it was drawn upside down or whatever. That's okay. That's okay in organic chemistry. Because each of these little bonds that we have here, there's free rotation around it. So, 10 to the 6 times every second, this bond spins. This bond spins, this one spins, and so any structure you draw that has one, two, three, four, five carbons and a two carbon side chain is legal because they're spinning so fast, who knows what in the world it looks like at any particular time. If we do it this way and this way, these are absolutely identical. They're called conformational isomers. Exactly the same compound. They're just in a slightly different conformation. Now to show this, I made this little movie. It's called a hyperactive pentane. This is a computer animation of a five carbon straight chain as it just bounces around and does various things. Hopefully this will give you the idea that these things are just incredibly dynamic. Any way you draw it works because they're all spinning in all directions all the time. 
any way you draw it, as long as, in this case, we have five carbons in a row, you're right. Doesn't matter how you draw it. Any questions? All right, here we have five carbon main chain with a methyl group here in carbon number three. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon number three has a methyl. This could be our main chain, that's fine. This is drawn slightly differently. The methyl group I've rotated up this way. There's our chain. And this guy, our chain goes this way. But once again, it's a five carbon chain with a methyl group in carbon three. Doesn't matter how you draw the thing. For convenience, however, we tend to draw them in reasonable ways. That is, you take the longest chain, you make a nice zigzag, and put the other stuff on it. That makes it easier for me to look at and say, oh yeah, I know what they're drawing. All right, I said that you couldn't call these compounds George anymore, but we can give them names. The name is based on the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. As we look at these molecules on the screen here, our longest continuous chain, obviously here, is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Here, our longest chain is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And here, our longest chain, let's see. Probably want to do something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, one of the initial challenges when you're looking at an organic molecule is to identify the parent. This has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, so it's a hex. It's a hexane, because it's an alkane. This has one, two, three, four, five, six, so it's a hexane too, with a methyl group in carbon three. This has seven, so it's a heptane. And it has an ethyl group here, and a methyl group here. So step one, identify the longest chain. Once you do that, you need to look at, this is, it gets a little complicated, a little messy, but you want to look at your longest chain. You want to see what's attached to it. The rule says, you want the chain that has the greatest number of substituents. That's just the rule. So if we look at this guy, what's our longest chain? Well, we could do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That works. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now look at these two. Those are identical, aren't they? They're both seven carbons, so they're both heptane. Here in carbon two, we have a methyl group. Carbon two, we have a methyl. Carbon three, four, we have a three carbon, that's a propyl. One, two, three, four, that's a propyl. So they're identical, aren't they? There is, however, one more seven carbon chain you could draw. 
What if we went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Like that. The rule would say that's bad because this only has one substituent and this has two. Again, we're not going to be numbering or naming things like that in this course, but there are rules for that. Just make sure you understand that. Now we said, oh my gosh, look at this guy. <laughs> we have lots of stuff sticking out here, don't we? If we look here, we have three CH3s on this one poor carbon. Now this one is going to be part of our main chain, whatever that is. So we're going to have at least two methyls sticking out. When you have more than one of any substituent, we're going to do di, tri, tetra, whatever, in order to tell how many things we have attached to our chain. Our longest chain, think about this for a second, see if you can figure it out. Organic is so much fun. So much more fun than general chemistry. Our longest chain here. How about something like that? Eight carbons in a row. Now, what's attached to our eight carbons? If we let this be carbon one, we're going to have two methyl groups in carbon two. Carbon three is just a CH2. Carbon four, we're going to have a propyl group. That's three carbons. And carbon six will have another methyl group. So as far as our name goes, we have three methyl groups, don't we? So it's going to be a trimethyl. We have to tell where they are, so we're going to use our numbers as two, two, six. And our propyl is going to be on carbon one, two, three, four. Two, two, six trimethyl and four propyl. Again, it's an A chain, a carbon chain, so it's an octane. We're going to take all these, arrange them alphabetically. Don't worry about the tri when you do that, just the methyl. Don't worry about the multiplier. And this is 226 trimethyl 4 propyl octane. Now, as we know, we can take organic molecules and we can put things on them, we can put things in them. Um, halogens are a common thing to put on them. So let's take a molecule like this and just stick a halogen somewhere. Here's our eight carbon chain, but instead of a methyl group here, I put a chlorine. We're going to name this just like we did before. We have a 2,2 dimethyl, that's those two. We have a 4 propyl, just like before. Except now, instead of this being a methyl, it's simply a 6 chloro. So we would string these together alphabetically chloro, then methyl, then propyl. Oh. Gee, I, oh, there it is, 6 chloro 2 2 dimethyl 4 propyl octane 6 chloro 2 2 dimethyl 4 propyl octane So once again, you're not going to have big time naming. 
you need to understand just the basics for this exam. But let's just look at some naming problems just because they're fun. Our first one, we have to untangle the Newman again, don't we? As we look at this, what have we got? We have a chain of one, two, that carbon is three, four, five. So it's a pentane, isn't it? One, two, three, four, five. On carbon three, that's the one in the back, we have a methyl. If we took the step to draw it as a sawhorse, here we have carbon one, two, three, four, five. And on carbon one, two, three, we have the methyl. All right, so how would we name it? It's a pentane, isn't it? It's a pentane with a methyl on carbon number three. Let's do this as carbon one, two, three, methyl, pentane. Our next one, what's our longest chain? What are these little wedgies? Well, remember I said inorganic chemistry, stereochemistry is extremely important. Extremely important. You need to know where things are in space relative to each other. And we can show that by approximating what the tetrahedron might look like. So this bold wedgie means this is coming towards us. The dashed ones means that's going back. So this is our tetrahedron, up, down, forward, and back. All right, how many carbons in a row? One, two, three, four. In organic, four is butte. So it's a butane. All right, on carbon number one, two, we have two methyl groups. So it's a two, two, dimethyl butane. Start it up here. I can start anywhere I want. One, two, three, four. Two, two, dimethyl butane. Four carbons in a row. Carbon two, we have two methyls. Let's just take and swap one of the hydrogens here for a chlorine to see how that would change things. Our longest chain, I put two chlorines in, that's right. Um, our longest chain is still one, two, three, four carbons, isn't it? But now to keep the numbers the lowest, we have to let this guy be carbon one. So we're going to have a one, two, three dichloro. So one, three dichloro. And on carbon two, we have two methyls. Still a butane. And that would be one, three dichloro, two, two dimethyl as a butane. That's how you manage to <coughs> name organic compounds. Well, probably the most fun question on an exam is to go backwards. 
that nobody likes to write words. What if I gave you these? Two, two, three, trimethyl butane, two ethyl, two, 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 five, dimethyl hexane, or two, three, four, five, six, seven, hexamethyl octane. See if you can write these structures. This is actually my favorite way to test this. While you're doing this, I will be a really nice guy here and say um, a couple of you came in a, a little bit later than the really good guys. Uh, and I told the first people here, since there wasn't a great crowd because it was raining, okay, I'm here, um, that you could simply send me an email. Just say, hi, I, I was here, and I'll give you five points. Got it? Aww. Aww. I, I am a nice guy. It's a butane, so we need to zigzag with four carbons, right? So we start off with our four carbon zigzag. We'll let one end be carbon one, because somebody has to be. Right? On carbon two, two, and three, we have methyl groups. So carbon two, we have a methyl, carbon two, another methyl, carbon three, another methyl, and it should look like that. Our next guy is the hexane. You need to zigzag with six carbons. So zip, zip, pop, 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 down. Six carbons. Let's go ahead and draw that. And we'll let one end be number one. All right. Carbon number three, we have an ethyl. Ethyl is two carbons. So we find carbon three, that's this guy. We can have a two carbon chain coming up. Carbon two, we have two methyls. So two methyls right here. Two, two dimethyl, three ethyl. It should look like that. 2,2-dimethyl-3-ethyl. Two, two, Octane. Eight carbons in a zigzag. We let somebody be number one. Now we have methyl groups at carbons 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And it should look like that. Any questions? All right, well, we talked about isomers. I said that these bonds spin around really fast, and because they spin around really fast, we just ignore the actual conformation, and any way you draw it is fine. What I'm doing here is trying to tell a little more of the truth to it. As these things spin around, there actually is a difference. One of these is actually a preferred conformation over the others. We're not going to worry about that 
uh, because the energy difference at room temperature is minuscule. But just to make sure that you understand that I'm being honest, let's take ethane. So ethane is two carbons, six hydrogens, and I'm just going to spin around this bond. As I do, you should note that there are two obvious regions that are important. We have what's called the eclipsed. In the eclipsed, the hydrogens are next to each other. And as you see as they go by, they're darn near touching, aren't they? That's higher energy. And here, where they're in between, so they're not touching anybody, that's staggered. That's lower energy. If we actually plot out the energy difference here, it looks something like this. As we go back and forth, roughly 12 kilojoules per mole, the eclipsed, where they're touching, to barely touching, is the highest energy, and the other one is lowest. Now, again, at room temperature, this doesn't matter. But if you do things at very low temperatures, it really wouldn't matter. You can freeze out one conformation if you go low enough in temperature. Now this is a conformational isomer. Once again, we don't really worry about those because at room temperature it spins so fast, we can't tell. But a constitutional isomer is different. If you look at these two molecules, what's our molecular formula? Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. It's an alkane, so seven times two is 14 plus two is 16. This must be C7. H16. Look at this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. So it must also have 16 hydrogens. But clearly, these guys are different, aren't they? They have the same molecular formula but they're different. This is called a different constitution. Basically, they're just different molecules. They're different in every possible way, except that they both have seven carbons and 16 hydrogens. These are called constitutional isomers. One of the great games in organic chemistry is to present compounds like on an exam and say, are these the same? Or are they constitutional isomers? Another way you can do it is just as much fun. Write all the constitutional isomers for C3H8. All right, do that. How many ways can you connect three carbons and eight hydrogens? Start off with your zigzag. Now you need three carbons, got to put eight hydrogens in. How many ways can you do that? Only one. Only one way to do it. Three carbons in a row, six, eight hydrogens. Only one possible isomer for C3H8. Now we have to do it. All right, let's make it a little more fun. C3H6. Taken two hydrogens away. Now remember, carbon 
can form single bonds, it can form double bonds, and it can even form triple bonds. We know it can also form rings. But every carbon must always have four bonds to it. So if you put three carbons in a row, that requires eight hydrogens, right? How about if you make a triangle? If you make a triangle, you have three vertexes, don't you? That's six hydrogens. We could also do it with a double bond. This is C3H6. We have CH3, CH, and CH2. So here we have two possible constitutional isomers. One more time, C4H8. What if you drew a square? Every vertex would be a CH2, wouldn't it? Turns out there are five versions that you can draw here. You can make a three-membered ring with a methyl sticking out. You can make a four-member ring. We can have double bonds like this. Five possible isomers. Now these were simple, right? Back in the old days when I used to teach this class at UIC, the test question wouldn't be something like this. It was this one. C3H6O2. See what you can do with that. Remember, oxygen can be an OH group or it can bridge two carbons. Three carbons, two oxygens, but only six hydrogens. How in the world do you do that? Well, this is a little more complicated. This is one possible set. Carbon-oxygen double bonds, two oxygens, three carbons, six hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six. And it goes on and gets even more interesting. Here's the rest of the set. Now, I never really put this on an exam, but it's a fun thing to think about. The point here is that carbon compounds can be really, really complicated, really interesting. And again, the neat thing about organic is you can build darn near anything if you're good enough. Let's look at a real test question. Here we have two compounds that I ask. Are these identical constitutional isomers or different chemical compounds? We have here a Kekulé formula and we have a line drawing. <clears throat> Are these the same compounds? Well, let's just do a quick count here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. C5H12. C6H14. These are different chemical compounds.
Let's do one more and I'll hush for a second while you think about this one. Here we have a condensed structure, sort of. Again, I told you, you're going to see it written every way you can imagine. But this is sort of a condensed. Here I've shown the chlorine sticking out to make it easier. Here I haven't. <clears throat> now the way to do this is to look here and say, okay, what's our longest chain? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? We all see that. Over here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. six. They both have six carbon parent chains. All right, this one has a chlorine and carbon two, and a carbon, a chlorine and carbon four. This guy, well, I started here. Let's start here. One, two, chlorine and two, three, four, chlorine and four. Six carbon main, chlorine and two and four. Six carbon main, chlorine and two and four. These are identical. This is the category of question that you're going to get on this exam. So, you know, nothing really bizarre in terms of naming, but make sure you can convert um, condense, calculate, and line structures, and make sure you can detect isomerism. All right, now I mentioned that carbon can form double and triple bonds. The valence of carbon is still four. This carbon is bonded to one, two, three, four things. So is this one. This guy is bonded to one, two, three, four things. This just happens to be a double bond, and this is a triple bond. Now the parent chain here is still two carbons, isn't it? In order to indicate that there are two carbons in our chain, this is an eth. In organic, eth means two. Eth and eth. This is an example of an alkene. <coughs> in an alkene, we have a double bond, and we tag on E and E at the end instead of ane. And that tells us we have a double bond. Here we have a Y and E for an alkyne. Again, we have a triple bond. Let's talk about how we form these things and what this double bond nonsense means. To make an sp squared carbon, sp squared carbon, is what we have in a double bond. We're going to take, remember we have one S and three P's to work with. Okay, that's what we have to work with. We'll take one S and two of the P's and combine them. That means we can make three bonds. So we're going to do it like this. It's planar, 120 degree angles. It looks like that. Right? But we still have one extra p orbital left over, don't we? There's one on each carbon that's left over. We still have to have it somewhere, so let's stick it in there. One on this one and one on this one. Now, when these orbitals are aligned, the way I've shown them, they overlap. That means that the electrons mingle. And they form a hot dog bun. 
This is called a pi orbital, and it really is a hot dog bun. I will cut it in half. And you can see here's our two carbons in the middle. There's the top and bottom of our hot dog bun. This is the electrons being shared. <clears throat> because there are a total of two electrons in these two orbitals together, this is what constitutes our carbon-carbon double bond. This guy. One is our real bond, and the other is our pi bond. If you look at the electrostatic potential map, remember what that is. Here where we have our pi bond, nice big red splotch of electrons. The chemistry of an alkene, that is something with a double bond, is all dependent upon the fact that it's got this big red splotch where things can get electrons. That's the chemistry. One thing, remember I said that these guys had to line up? If you take and you twist this so it looks like this, they don't line up. And that means that there's a real energy barrier to go from this to this. Because here we have a bond, and here we don't. So we're losing lots of energy to do that. That means whenever we have a double bond in a compound, we can have more stereoisomers. Remember I said it was so important and organic as to how things were oriented relative to each other. Here we have two groups on the same side of our double bond. Here we have two on opposite sides. We call this cis and we call this trans. Now, why is that important? Why do you care about that? Well, you're sitting here looking at me, aren't you? Or looking at something. Maybe a phone, I don't know. But you're looking at something. Vision. In your retina, you have a compound that has a cis double bond. It's a retinal and it has a cis double bond. When a photon of light hits it, it's absorbed, and that switches to a trans double bond. When it does, it changes geometry, and your little cell says, oh my goodness, I just saw a photon. And that's vision. Isn't that neat? Can you tell when this thing is on the opposite side and this one's on the same? It looks the same to me. No, if you think about it, here's a double bond. These are both on the same side of it, and here wow. they're on opposite sides of it. Wow. Okay. Remember that you cannot rotate around this unless you put in energy. In vision, photon hits it, switches over, and you see something. It's amazing. How about a triple bond? Triple bond. We're going to call this SP. So we're only going to use the S and one of the P's. That gives us two bonds to work with. So it's linear, 180. But we have two P's left over. The two P's, we have two P's on each of the carbons. Look like that. They kind of overlap, and you make a double hot dog bun. This side and this side. Again, the carbons are in the middle. This is what constitutes our triple bond. Here's our real bond, and then two of these pi bonds. Look at the electrostatic potential map big belt of red electrons right in between. Again, that is the source of the chemistry of these guys. 
So one thing that I would like you to remember for the exam, carbon can form single, double, and triple bonds. This has one pi bond, and this has two. We will see that these are examples of what we call functional groups. The simplest functional group we said was an alkane. An alkane doesn't really do much in the way of reaction. It's CnH2n plus 2. An alkene, because we have all of these electrons in the middle, is very reactive. And an alkyne with even more electrons is more reactive. These are functional groups. Let me just show you an example of <coughs> functional group behavior. This is an alkene. This is an alcohol. And this is an ether. An alcohol has an OH group attached to a carbon. Here we put the oxygen in between two carbons. Now when I say functional group reactivity, there are so many different organic compounds, it would just be impossible to understand their chemistry if it wasn't for the fact that the functional groups all react essentially the same. So let's just look at an alkene. If we take a carbon-carbon double bond and we add bromine to it, Br2, plain old bromine, what we wind up is a 1,2-dibromide. These are actually opposite sides, so they're trans to each other. Now, one of the things that organic chemists do is they wonder about how these reactions occur. That's the mechanism of the reaction. For something like this, it's fairly well understood. Let's start off with this simple alkene, and this is bromine. The first step, we're going to donate a Br plus to this big pile of electrons that's sitting here between these carbons. When we do that, we wind up with what's called a bromonium ion. Bromonium ion is very reactive. Here's the bromine sitting on this big pile of electrons. That's all it's doing. But we have another Br minus here. Br minus can now come attack here. When it does, it breaks this bond, and we wind up with our 1,2 dibromide. Virtually all alkenes undergo this same reaction. Doesn't matter what's attached to the double bond. And that's why you can understand organic chemistry. Now it can be complicated. Here's just an example. These are some of the reactions of alkenes. Just some. But regardless what's attached to here, these are all going to undergo the same reaction to give the same types of compounds. And that's how you do organic. Let's just take a quick look here at the functional groups. I'm not going to ask you about any functional groups, I'll be honest, except alkenes, alkanes, and alkynes. That's all you need to know. But let's look at the others just for diversity. Alkanes, only sp3 bonds, single bonds, like ethane. Alkene is a double bond. Alkyne is a triple. This is really interesting. This is called an air read. If you take six of these sp squared carbons in a row, put them in a ring, this is called benzene. Benzene's a remarkable compound. It's a naturally occurring compound. Um, it's a great solvent. When I was a child, 
We used to use it to wash our hands. Um, it is now a fat of carcinogen, so you don't do that anymore, but didn't used to be. Um, when Perrier drinking water first came out, it came from these deep wells. Turns out it was contaminated with natural benzene, and they had to develop a way to scrub it out, but they did. Um, it's a natural compound. It's a marvelous substance. Um, here we have our six carbons. Here are all the p orbitals. If you overlap all of these, see the big honking red spot with all these electrons. Marvelous compound. We've seen halides. Alcohol is an OH. Oxygen between is an ether. Stick an NH2 on there, call that an amine. We're going to see amino acids, so pay attention to this one. This is an amine, NH2. Nitrile, carbon nitrogen triple bond. Nitro group, NO2. Nitrile methane. Um, performance car fuel, also an explosive. Thiols, they really stink. Butane thiol, essence of skunk. Sulfides, they stink too. If we have a carbon-oxygen double bond, that's called a carbonyl. Aldehydes and ketones, we will see this in a minute. Carboxylic acid, carbonyl with an OH. This is an ester if we have an OR. Amid, again, we'll see this in a minute. Carbonyl with an NH on it. Acid halide, anhydride. The carbonyl is a very important functional group. We're going to see this when we do our quick tour of biochem. It's an important functional group because remember electronegativity? Remember that? We did that. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, isn't it? Because of that, this is a polar covalent bond. Look at the electrostatic potential map. Big red up here, real blue at the bottom. The reason that this is important is this carbon, because it's blue, is very reactive. Something with electrons can add here. We'll see that this is how we make proteins, for example. The chemistry is very simple. This is methyl alcohol. It has electrons. This is positive. It can simply add. When it does, the electrons are displaced up, going to a hydrogen. Here's our intermediate. We added this stuff. Here's what we have. Finally, if we lose water, we get the functional group of ester. <clears throat> Again, the key to this is the carbonyl carbon will accept electrons. Now let's move into biochemistry and put this in biochem perspective. We've all heard of amino acids. We now know what amines and acids are. This is arginine. It's an amino acid. It has an amino group attached to the carbon and a carboxylic acid. Amino acids also have a side chain. The side chains can be positive. This is a guanidine residue, it's called. This is a histidine residue, it's called. Simple amino group, these are all positive. These are negative ones. They're both carboxylic acids. Again, amino acids. These are uncharged but polar. So we have an alcohol, another alcohol. This is an amide. Remember the amide? Here's another one. <coughs> Thiols, remember they stink. Selenium compounds, they stink too. This is glycine. It's the simplest amino acid, simply the amino group and the acid. And this is proline. 
throwing, makes up hair, nails, stuff like that. I've got this funny little ring down on the side. And these are the neutral guys. These are not water soluble. They're simple alkane chains hanging out. Benzene rings is a phenol. Um, and when you make a protein, what you do is you take these amino acids and you will stick them together. Now you stick them together using a carbonyl reaction just like we saw just a little bit ago. For example, if I had this amino acid, this is serine with an OH group, this is alanine, just has a CH3. What I'm going to do is take this nitrogen, I'm going to attack this carbon and make a bond. When I do, I'm going to lose the OH and this H and make water. I have now made the amide functional group, haven't I? And what I've done is I've taken two amino acids and linked them together. Now, this end is still an acid. This end is still an amine. I can do this over and over and over and over, can't I? Here I have stuck a leucine, a glycine, a serine, and an alanine all together to make what's called a peptide. Peptide is just a bunch of amino acids stuck together through amide bonds to form a chain. Now if I do this over and over and over and over again, by George, I get a protein. That's where proteins come from. It's simply the polyamide chain here. The amino and the acid groups combine, and you make this continuous chain that looks something like this. Primary protein structure, that's the actual sequence of the amino acids. But the neat thing about it, remember we said that we had things that were water soluble, things that weren't, things that were positive, things that were negative. When this protein hits water, it folds up. It folds up into something. And it always folds the same way. This is a model of lysozyme. That's an enzyme. See the little curly cues? Those are called alpha helices. That's where the amino acids hydrogen bond to each other to form this helix structure. <clears throat> this up here is called a beta sheet. Here's just another way to look at it. You can see the alpha helices as they form. <clears throat> this is a unique protein shape that all lysozymes will have. In a second, this should change again. And you'll never be able to pick these features out again. There it goes. This is what it actually looks like. You can't see any of the structure anymore. But you see these little clefts, these little openings that are in there? That's how an enzyme works. Turns out that this little opening here just happens to fit exactly the 3D structure of the thing it's acting on. So it will come in, it will bind to that little cleft, and it will do its chemistry. It's an amazing lock and key sort of thing. The other biomolecules I want to talk about are going to be RNA, DNA, and fatty acids. RNA, DNA. 
Here we're starting off with ribose. Ribose is a sugar. It's four carbons and an oxygen and a ring, so a five-membered ring, CH2OH, and hydroxyl groups around. Um, this is ribose, as an OH group here. Deoxyribose, as in DNA, has a hydrogen instead. That's the only real difference. So this will occur in DNA. This will occur in RNA. Deoxyribose and ribose. They will be bonded to bases. These are complex organic molecules. This is guanine and adenine. And the neat thing about these guys is that they can pair up in a very specific way. Oh, here's the other two pairs, cytosine and thymine. Um, unless you're dealing with RNA, then you have uracil instead. But oh, so we have these four players. They can bond this way, pair up, and they're designed so that they can form hydrogen bonds. Here's one from an NH to an oxygen, NH to a nitrogen, and an NH to an oxygen. These three hydrogen bonds form. That's how a guanine knows that it's next to a cytosine. That's how we do um, <clears throat> the duplication, the replication of DNA and even RNA using um, this sort of base pairing. We've all seen this sort of thing. Again, here's our pairing. You can see the hydrogen bonding here between the bases. This is a replicating strand. So we're taking and we're adding new DNA in here and expanding this thing out. <clears throat> and this is what it kind of looks like in 3D. You can see your bases here. They're hydrogen bonded on the inside. The outside here is our polyphosphate ribose backbone with all these things in the middle. Hang on a second. That's out of change. There it goes. Again, you can see the polyphosphate on the outside and all the uh, DNA bases now on the inside. Any questions? Well, the last functional group we're going to look at is yet another view. And you can see here the base is a little bit better, how they're hydrogen bonding. And again, the uh, sugar phosphates all on the outside. <clears throat> the next lab we're going to do is going to deal with fat. This is what we mean by a fatty acid, free fatty acid. This is a long chain of carbon atoms. It has a double bond, so it's an alkene, right? What is the stereochemistry of this double bond? Are the carbons on the same side or opposite sides? The same side. So this is a cis fatty acid. If they were on opposite sides, it would be a trans fatty acid. I'm sure you've heard of that. Trans fatty acids are bad because your body doesn't know how to eat them. They eat only cis. So this is a fatty acid. Long chain of carbons and a carboxylic acid on the end. <clears throat> we hook three of them together with a uh, try alcohol, we make esters, we get something like this called a triglyceride. This is your common fat. <clears throat> if you want to make a membrane to surround the cell, you will use a phospholipid. Again, the same basic bottom chain here, both esters, except now we put a group here that's polar. 
very water soluble. So think what you got. You've got this, this is water, totally water insoluble, and you've got this, this water soluble. This is how we make a membrane. A membrane, all these nonpolar things grouped together, all the polar ends are on both sides, and it's a barrier. This is how we take and close everything inside of a cell. We wrap it in a membrane. Stuff can't get through unless you design some mechanism to make it get through. Phospholipid, and here's our membrane. Now the one thing that everybody has heard about in terms of all of this really has gotten a bad rap, and that is something that can dissolve in this membrane with one end sticking out, and that is cholesterol. Cholesterol is a marvelous molecule. All these rings, here's a double bond, and an alcohol OH. This is barely water soluble. This is really not. And this can kind of go and nestle itself into membranes. Now, our body needs cholesterol. Your liver makes almost all the cholesterol that's in your body. As we eat food, we do get some cholesterol from it. But almost all of the cholesterol in your body you make yourself. Doesn't matter what you eat. Back in the 50s, President Eisenhower had a series of heart attacks and, you know, darn near died. <clears throat> Nobody quite knew what was going on. He really liked his eggs and bacon and all this stuff. And they did like a biopsy and they found that his arteries is what kind of looked like this. They had these big plaques in there, and they were full of fat and cholesterol. <clears throat> and so they said, well, he likes his bacon and eggs. That's where this came from. And all of a sudden, the entire world went on a fat-free, cholesterol-free diet with no scientific basis whatsoever. There still is none. Fats and cholesterol are fine. They really are. We'll do this in chapter 16. But <clears throat> this is what a plaque looks like. It's ugly, and it'll kill you. But it's not because you like your bacon. Finally. There are no tutorials from now on. The ones that we have for this next exam are balancing mole mass, moles in mass, percent comp, molarity, boil, Charles, ideal. If you do this one, it's worth 10 points because it's hard. <clears throat> for the last chapter, we have conjugate acid base, basic pH, and pH problems. There are 12 of them. You do them all, that's 65 points. That's a good thing. Any questions? <clears throat> now, next week, we're going to do a fat lab of some sort. But on Wednesday, I'm not sure what we're going to do because I inadvertently put an extra chapter.